thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, Helsinki is a beautiful city. Um, like I was introduced, my name is Eric Basic. I am the GE Research Fellow at the Sensible City Lab at MIT. Um, I'm here to present to you today the Copenhagen Wheel. Um, I'll start off with uh, a bit of a background to the project and the lab and the kind of work that we do. Uh, so the Sensible City Lab works um, at kind of the interface of digital technologies and understanding how the ubiquity of urban computing in the urban environment is changing the way that we experience and understand the cities around us. So I'm sure almost everyone has a mobile phone in their pocket um, or in their bag or something. And if you think of all the other sensors that are um, embedded throughout the city, um, looking at cameras, uh, traffic sensors, any type of image capture device, they're all over the city. So what, if we take all that information that's being thrown off by the city, how can we analyze it and understand it in a more meaningful way and how can it change the way uh, we behave or the way we understand the city? So that's kind of this, the space we work in. If you have the digital cloud and the physical city, how can we mediate that space a bit? And so cities are obviously extremely complex systems. If you think about all the material flows and energy flows, uh, the commerce, the economic activity, everything that flows in and out of a city every day, like the pulse of kind of like a beating heart, if you think of it that way. It's, a, it's an extraordinarily complex system. And so in order to deal with the complexity of this system, we uh, employ researchers, uh, experts, postdocs, graduate students from a wide variety of, um, of backgrounds and fields of expertise. We work with um, digital visualization artists, we have social scientists, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, planners, architects, um, just a really multi-faceted, uh, diverse group of people to come together to try and tackle some of these problems. And so any one of these people can be working together on groups, and usually people work on a few projects at a time. So um, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas throughout the lab. So the lab is driven by partnerships, mainly between industry and municipalities. We get corporate sponsors like um, Volkswagen, Audi, um, AT&T, General Electric, British Telecom, um, to come together and partner with cities like Singapore, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Bolzano, Copenhagen, to tackle problems at the urban scale. So a lot of these large infrastructure-oriented companies have interest in the city, and uh, cities obviously have interest in their own populations and how um, the cities are being run. So it's a nice kind of synergy that we create there, and we try to find the sweet spot in the middle of how people's lives and decisions can uh, impact the both of them. So every spring we have a workshop, and I shouldn't really call it a workshop, it's actually more of a class that runs the full 14 weeks of the semester, where we get graduate students primarily from MIT and some from up the street at Harvard to, uh, to come down, and we, we match them with a city or a company and we say, okay, here's a specific urban problem we want you to think about. And so there's groups of maybe four or five kids that, I shouldn't call them kids, most of them are in their mid-20s. <laughs> they get together and, and tackle the problem and think about how distributed infrastructure and distributed computing can um, help, help resolve some of these issues that are occurring in the urban environment. So here's some shots of us doing site visit. That's in Thessaloniki, Greece. And then, like I said, the ideas that they come up with after being in the field and, and meeting the relevant stakeholders and understanding the problem in context, they come back to, uh, to the institute and we work with them to resolve the problem or their solution, kind of refine it over the course of the semester. And so following a um, similar process like that, the labs produced, I think, 63 projects or something since it first was uh, created in 2004. Uh, and they all diverse, they have a, all a very diverse range of um, of scale and scope. Some of them are urban design products where we're actually making things that can be sold at a commercial level. Some of them are more at an infrastructure scale. Um, and some of them are just exercises in um, understanding the possibilities of what the future could hold. So it's a really a broad mix, which I think keeps it very interesting for everybody. And so one of these projects, among the 63 that I just briefly talked about, is the Copenhagen Wheel. So that was a bit of a, an introduction to understand how we got to this project. So the, the wheel was a student project that came out of a collaboration with the city of Copenhagen back in 2008, I believe. And this is before my time at the lab, so I'm going to speak about it as best as I can. Copenhagen, I guess, has been a bicycle city for a long time. It has a rich history of, of cycling. I guess maybe the flat topography makes it a, an ideal location to be riding your bike everywhere. But 
nonetheless, there's an absolutely huge amount of bicycling that goes on in the cities. You can tell from <laughs> some of these bike racks. Uh, and so it was an interesting challenge that um, the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen came to us and said, okay, about 55% of our population uses bicycles on a daily basis to commute either to their place of work uh, or to the place of education. And we're like, wow, congratulations, <laughs> your job's done. But they're like, no, what about the other 45%? How can we get them on bikes? Like, what's holding them back from using bicycles? And so that, that really got us to scratch ahead to think about what we could do to lower the barrier of entry to get more people using bikes on a more regular basis. And so our vision was, you know, the rain is one of the biggest things that keeps people off their bikes or bad weather, but we really can't do anything about that. The second biggest one was um, distance. And so sometimes people feel that their commute is too far or they feel that they're going to get too sweaty or something on the way to work, so they'd rather take the automobile. And so our idea was, well, what if we could somehow give some level of assistance to people riding their bikes to help them go a bit farther, make their ride a bit easier. And so that got us thinking about the idea of regenerative energy storage on bicycles. So for the project brief, um, we decided that it made a lot of sense to reduce the embodied energy and allow people to keep the bikes they already have. We didn't like the idea of having to buy a completely new e-bike when most people, especially in Copenhagen, already had their own bikes. So if it could be easily retrofitted, that would be ideal. And we wanted to be able to regenerate as much power as possible. So any type of braking or even an exercise mode could be possible that people could, through just pedaling and riding the bike, could be able to recharge the batteries. Um, had to have an intelligent locking mechanism for safety and theft deterrent. <laughs> and the, um, the electric motor should be just an assist. So we didn't want people to just get on the bike and hit the throttle and take off like a motorbike. The idea is to encourage exercise and keep people being active. So the idea is that the bike should only contribute as much effort as you're willing to put in or maybe multiply it a little bit. And then the whole concept of urban sensors was, like, as I said, is a central thesis to, the, to what the lab does. And so we're looking at, okay, now we have this smart, intelligent piece of infrastructure essentially rolling around the city. What if we imbued it with certain sensors to understand more about the urban environment? We can understand the type of pollution levels, um, traffic congestion, all types of parameters that affect cyclists in the city. It could be a useful sensor to be out there. And then, like I said, about fitness and activity, I think it would be a great thing to... Uh, to give people some feedback about their fitness goals while riding the bike. So these are some of the early sketches that started the project back in 08, and I guess it's evolved a lot since then, but this just gives you a sense of kind of the back of the napkin sketch of how any good idea starts. Um, these are by Carlo, just first thinking about the spoking system and how we could have this turning hub that wasn't at the center of the wheel. And so as we were talking about uh, demo or die, making prototypes, this is all about um, modeling in the early stages, so just getting the students in the workshop to think about innovative ways of how this thing could look and how it could be put together, and coming up with some pretty wacky <laughs> models, <laughs> some that obviously didn't work and some that seemed a bit more promising. And so over, over the last couple of years, the form has really refined. Um, obviously, digital modeling and 3D rapid prototyping has played a major role in help designing the wheel and cutting down its form factor. Here's a, the, the current desk, actually, where all the prototypes and, <laughs> and 3D prints are coming together. A bit of a mess. So um, in 2010, we got some additional funding from the project. Copenhagen had funded the first stage of it, and um, they were happy with the results. And the Italian Ministry of the Environment wanted to get on board and help make a more, uh, a more formal, more real prototype. And so they donated a bunch of money and suggested that we worked with an Italian manufacturer. So we worked with Ducati Energia to make this round of prototyping. So I think there's about 12 of these wheels made by Ducati. And it, it was a pretty good design, but it's actually quite heavy, <laughs> this one. So um, the most recent round of prototyping we're doing right now is cut down the weight significantly. And now we're trying to get it more towards a commercial product right now. Um, we got it down to just under four kilos, which is a pretty reasonable weight compared to this one, which I think was maybe two or two and a half times that weight, which isn't acceptable. So this is essentially how the wheel works if you break it down. Um, you have the external spokes and casing, so we call that red part the chassis, and that's the turning body that holds everything together. So you look at all the parts to the right, they're actually completely static within that wheel, and it's just this red external shell turning around it. And so there's a lot of reasons for that. We didn't want to have the rotating mass. If you have your battery pack flipping around for every wheel revolution that really destabilizes and creates a lot of vibration issues within the wheel. So 
despite what it looks like, the majority of the internal workings are completely static. There's environmental sensors and GPS, uh, the battery control systems and the batteries themselves uh, organized in an outer ring. Then you have the rotating casing, the motor, which is a coreless motor in this diagram, and there's still debate whether or not we're going to go ahead with that. Uh, there's internal planetary gear, um, a torque sensor, and a casing and a torque arm, which has actually been removed from the more recent design too, so they don't have that external torque arm. And so like I said, there's some environmental sensors involved. We're looking at carbon monoxide or um, NOx, noise, distance travel that are all um, contained within the hub. Um, one thing I haven't really mentioned is that there's no external batteries or wires or anything in the retrofit of the wheel, and it's all con controlled by your iPhone. So via Bluetooth, you can communicate with, um, with the hub, and you can keep the phone. It could be on the handlebars like this, or it could just easily be in your pocket. And you just set the effort level that you want it to match. So if you want to pedal with a certain pressure that the bike and the hub will match that pressure or double that pressure. Like, and it's all controlled through the phone. Here's an example of what the phone interface um, looks like. We developed the app originally on iPhone, but um, the most recent work's been on Android just because it's a lot more flexible system to work with. But this shows an iPhone, but that's a bit misleading. So you have uh, your exercise mode if you wanted, or you can have your assistance level, and you control that all with simple one touch, and same with the gear changing. And there's talk about maybe having uh, weather reports or any type of other ambient information that could be useful. There's more pictures of the phone and the interface with the environmental sensor talking about carbon emissions or pollution. And there's also a social networking component of it that people can, who are wheel riders can interact with their friends and get in touch with them, meet up. So this is a picture of the Ducati prototype. Like I said, we're, this one's a bit outdated now. It's a bit too heavy, but the images still look pretty good and gets the idea across how it works. OK. So the project was originally unveiled at the Copenhagen Climate Summit. And this is when we just had finished the uh, first round of prototypes. And so we got the mayor of Toronto and the Lord Mayor of Copenhagen at the time to, uh, to test it out in Copenhagen. But I think um, it was maybe too big of a hit and generated a lot of excitement at the time. And it's taken us a while to actually resolve all the engineering challenges and issues that go along with trying to make a commercial-ready product. Um, so based on the reception that we got from cities and the amount of excitement that it produced um, with city leadership, we've been thinking a lot about um, developing and deploying it as a fleet system. And that might really make it easier to uh, keep a handle on the maintenance and the upkeep. And especially for the early release of the prototype, there's bound to be some challenges and unforeseen problems we're going to have to deal with. So um, yeah, deploying in cities, I think, could be a, a potential strategy. We've been talking with the city of Copenhagen and with Sydney, Australia, as well as possible um, venues for that type of deployment. So this just kind of like recaps what the key factors are. We're trying to get it to an, down to an affordable price point, And we're looking primarily to target Europe in the beginning, just because there's more of a culture of both biking and e-biking around here, I think. Um, European markets would be much more receptive to this product, and maybe later we could start rolling it out in the United States. I have just a final video that kind of summarizes everything we talked about, and in case there's anything you missed. Welcome to the Copenhagen Wheel, the wheel that turns your ordinary bike into a smart electric hybrid, quickly and easily with no additional batteries or wires. The Copenhagen Wheel allows you to capture the energy dissipated while braking and cycling, and save it for when you need a bit of a boost. 
controlled through your smartphone, the Copenhagen Wheel becomes a natural extension of your everyday life. The Copenhagen Wheel is your personal trainer, sensing your effort level and providing you with real-time feedback about your fitness and exercise goals. The Copenhagen Wheel also enhances your experience of the city. It connects you with things a cyclist wants to know, upcoming traffic congestion, road conditions and pollution levels. Choose to keep your data or share it with your friends and other cyclists through social networks like Facebook. As you ride, you also collect green miles. It's similar to a frequent flyer program, but good for the environment. Elegant, responsive, smart. A new mode of transport for a rapidly changing world. So turn on your life and turn on the city. The Copenhagen Wheel. Great. Um, so yeah, that was the Copenhagen Wheel. It's on display right now at the Design Museum, so I encourage you all to uh, stop by, check it out. Thank you very much.